Good morning, everyone. It's Russ Barkley back again with your weekly research roundup. Uh, but as always, we're going to start with our customary dad joke. This one comes from X, and it's over at the Dad Jokes subscriber there at X, and it is, what is the worst insult you can say to a ghost? Get a life. I kind of like that one. Thought that was okay. Okay, enough dad jokes. I'm not going to give you too many uh, this morning. Before we get started in the research review, I do want to mention what I said last week, and that is I'm no longer listing all of the studies that were published that week in the description with the video. Most of you don't care about those. You're not reading them. So all I'm listing now are the articles and the hot links to them that I'm covering in the video. Now, a few of you wrote to say, oh, but you really like those, that listing of other publications. Well, that's great, but rather than me spend my time doing that, since most subscribers don't care, uh, here's something that you can do, and this is what I do. Open up Google Scholar. Under the uh, menu for the details for that website, just go to the menu, Look under notifications. It allows you to enter any topic. I use ADHD there. And here's what Google Scholar will do. Every week, sometimes twice a week, they will send you an email listing all of the research that was published online that week on that topic. That's how I keep up with it. And you can too now. And it provides you with the hot links over to all the studies. Mind you, some of these are just master's theses. Others are dissertations that are being published at university websites. I don't discuss those because they're not peer reviewed and most of them aren't particularly noteworthy in terms of advancing our knowledge. Also, you'll get notifications on animal studies that might pertain to ADHD. As you know, I don't review those either. But if you're interested in being alerted to everything that's being published during a particular week, that's the easiest way to do it. Google Scholar, go under the menu, look at notifications, and set it up to alert you for articles. Okay, so that's a good way that we can get around this problem and save me some time. All right, the first article up this week of the six we're going to talk about is actually a review, and I really like this review. It was published over in the Journal of Pediatric Pharmacology and Therapeutics, and it's a review by several experts in pharmacology on the pearls of stimulant treatment for ADHD in youth. Uh, it's an excellent review. It goes through and advises clinicians on how to manage people, children in this case, with ADHD when they're taking medication under special circumstances, or should there be adverse comorbidities like anxiety, mania, psychosis, or what happens if individuals develop difficulties with tics or Tourette syndrome? Uh, what about kids with cardiac problems? And it walks through each of these issues and provides a consensus recommendation based on reviews of the literature of how clinicians ought to deal with these issues. And I know some of you have raised issues like this in your replies to me or directly in emails to me. So here's a really nice review that you might not be interested in it, but if you have a child with ADHD uh, and you're wondering about these issues or some of these issues might be coming up in your family's situation, then you might want to print out this review. It is available, it's open access. Uh, and take it with you to talk about these issues with your pediatrician or your child psychiatrist. So I thought it was an excellent review and I'll just wanted to alert you to its existence in case you had questions about how do I deal with this event when my child is taking stimulant medication. So there you go. We don't have time to go through all of those. I've covered a lot of this over in my uh, review my uh, video on ADHD medications, but uh, have a look at that review if you're interested. All right, next up is a paper on the incidence of valvular heart disease in children and adults who are taking methylphenidate. Uh, and this is a global review. It involves more than 29,000 
individuals who are taking methylphenidate. And it talks about what is the incidence of this kind of heart disease or heart problem in people on the medicine. Uh, and what it finds is that out of that 29,000 plus cases, 23 reported some kind of valvular heart disease. That's a ratio of eight out of every 10,000 reports of people taking this medication. There were reports in 13 adults, 10 children. In the subsequent analyses that they did, uh, they found that most of the cases were concerned with injury to the mitral valve, but the incidence is very low, and further analyses showed that it was not elevated in children, but was in adults. But I want to reiterate what these authors also say, to their credit, this is a very, very rare side effect, and it could be associated with ADHD and its severity rather than with the medication. Now, as you know, this is a correlation, not a cause. So while it implies that the medicine might be leading to this problem, it could also be other extenuating factors, such as severity of disease, that, of ADHD that is, which is associated with greater problems with heart disease, we know that. Uh, and so the methylphenidate might simply be a marker for severity of disorder. But we do have to take this seriously as they conclude. Uh, there is a bit of a safety signal here, but it's very, very rare. It's eight one hundredths of a percent risk. So again, this illustrates that something can be statistically significant because of the large sample being used, but clinically a very, very rare event that would not lead us to change the way we practice in prescribing medication for ADHD. But a nice article published over there in Pharmacoepidemiology and Drug Safety, this one coming from researchers out of France, but it is a review of a very large database. Okay, here's one out of China that was published in the Journal of Public Health. And this is a study on the exposure to mosquito repellents during early life and risk for ADHD-like behaviors. Now, the reason for that ADHD-like behaviors is the authors were not able to render any diagnosis of ADHD. They didn't do full evaluations. They simply used a rating scale to detect the presence of ADHD symptoms within the children that they were following. So this is a very large database of more than 12,000 individuals over in this particular city in China. Uh, and they do report a small but significant association between early life exposure to mosquito repellents and an increase in ADHD-like symptoms. So of those with early life exposure, they were 80% more likely to show an increase in symptoms. This doesn't mean they had the disorder at all. And it was particularly sensitive during the one to three year age group. Also, they did find that dose of exposure did seem to increase risk as well. So on the surface, this, of course, yet again, sounds like mosquito repellents might contribute to risk for later ADHD. But as you know, correlation is not cause. One could also interpret this as saying that families with ADHD in parents and in children tend to live in areas that are poorer, more impoverished, more mosquito infected, and therefore more likely to be exposed to mosquito repellents. One could make the case either way. And as we've said before, you gotta be careful about interpreting these as one-way causal directions from some toxin or some risk factor to ADHD when it's very possible that it could just be the opposite as well. So we don't know, certainly worth keeping in mind, but let's not go changing public policy based on a correlation. Okay, nice little study out of China there. Up next is an interesting discussion 
of comorbid ADHD in women diagnosed with premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Uh, this is a study that included small groups of women. So there were 58 women with PMDD and 50 control women. And they were assessed several times throughout their monthly cycle <clears throat> using not only assessments of ADHD, but of impulsivity and of other aspects such as memory problems uh, related to the phase of their menstrual cycle. And what they found, and we can read it here, is that overall the women in the PMDD group did experience an increase in memory problems, difficulties focusing attention, and to some extent problems with dysfunctional impulsivity across these phases of their menstrual cycle, from pre-ovulatory to mid-luteal and then late luteal phases of the cycle. Most interesting from our perspective, however, is that among the women in the PMDD group, they had a larger significantly larger percentage of them also had ADHD. And among the women who had ADHD and PMDD, they reported even worse difficulties with memory and impulsivity throughout these phases of their cycle. So this fits with my earlier video where I spoke about the influence of female hormones on ADHD in women. And it just continues to affirm that there are these significant associations and that we can expect a worsening of certain symptoms of ADHD during particular phases of the menstrual cycle. So uh, a nice review there published over at the Journal of Women's Health. Next up, I'm going to talk about sleep disturbance in ADHD children and its relationship to melatonin. As I have said in many of my videos, sleeping problems occur quite often in children and adults with ADHD. On average, about 40% or more have some kind of sleeping difficulty. Well, this article over in uh, the Journal of Neurological Research is a study that looks at certain kinds of sleeping difficulties in ADHD children and in a control group of typically developing children. And then it also assessed degree of motor activity during sleep and salivary melatonin in these groups. And, and what did it find? ADHD children showed much higher frequency of sleep disturbances, higher sleep latency, that means it took longer to fall asleep, and lower sleep efficiency, not as efficient sleep, leaving them tired the next day, most likely, compared to the typically developing kids. They also found, and this is what's new in this study, is that the group with ADHD had lower levels of melatonin at night. And perhaps this might be a factor contributing to some of their sleeping difficulties. But when they looked across their rating scale of sleeping difficulties, both in initiating and maintaining sleep, they found that while that was associated with nocturnal melatonin, it was also significantly associated with the extent of total behavioral problems in the evening. And indeed, both the sleeping difficulties and the melatonin were related to behavioral problems. So here, we find it very complicated. How do you sort this out? Is it the low melatonin leading to the sleeping difficulties? Maybe. Do they simply go together? ADHD individuals have both sleeping difficulties and low melatonin, but they're not causally related to each other. And then do those kids with higher rates of behavior problems have the greatest risk of sleeping difficulties? Is it the behavior problems? <clears throat> Excuse me. So could be any of those explanations, but I thought this was interesting in finding lower levels of melatonin in kids with ADHD, especially those with sleeping difficulties. But <clears throat> as we know, one of the recommendations for kids with such sleeping difficulties is to supplement their bedtime sleep hygiene or routine, as we call it, 
with some sublingual melatonin that might be helpful at inducing sleep about 20 to 30 minutes earlier than usual. <clears throat> okay, interesting study there. Thought you might like that. Last up in our weekly review is a review of reviews. This is interesting. This is where the authors go out and find other reviews, group them all together, and then review all the results of those reviews. So kind of a, it's not really a meta analysis, but a meta review. Uh, and what do they find? Well, they found seven other reviews of the literature, some of which were meta analyses. And they found that vitamin D, if it is higher during a woman's pregnancy, there is a lower risk of ADHD in the offspring of those women. So suggesting that maybe vitamin D is protective from ADHD, maybe. Hold on there, these are just correlations. The second was that they found that children with ADHD had significantly lower vitamin D levels on average. And finally, they identified a couple of reviews where they had compared vitamin D supplementation to a placebo or to no treatment and found that if they supplemented the children's vitamin D, the ADHD improved in its symptoms. So all of that certainly suggests that vitamin D is related to ADHD and supplementing it might be helpful, but let's qualify this. First of all, in looking at the literature myself, it's only the children with low vitamin D to begin with who seem to show some benefits from vitamin D supplementation. So it doesn't benefit everybody, but just those who were low to begin with. And it may improve their symptoms. It certainly does not get rid of their disorder. Second, although women with low vitamin D had a greater risk of having ADHD children, Let's keep in mind, mothers with ADHD, women with ADHD, have a poorer diet. And as a result, it may be that it's their ADHD that's leading to these nutritional deficiencies, and it's their ADHD that is creating the risk in ADHD in their offspring. And it's not the vitamin D at all. These studies can't address that issue of causality. Indeed, most, if not all of them, ignored whether or not moms had ADHD. They weren't genetically informed studies. And without doing that, it gets very hard to interpret what is going on here. So once again, we have to be careful not to rush off with public health policies and recommendations for vitamin D supplementation of pregnant women when it may not be that at all. Could be that, but it might not be that. And yet we often find people want to draw causal inferences from correlational data. Okay, that's it for this week. I hope you enjoyed this review of these articles as well as my silly little dad joke. And I look forward to seeing you next week for another research review. And don't forget that little tip I gave you about using Google Scholar and setting up notifications so that you too just like me, can be notified weekly of whatever new research is being published in the literature. Okay, everybody, have a great weekend and live well and be well. Take care.